two, two thoughts of what I've already heard that I, I move to uh, clarify. One is that uh, probably one of the toughest assignments I ever had is that a year and a half I spent in Austria. We could only get away every other weekend for skiing. So I consider it a bit of a, a sacrifice. <clears throat> the other is uh, Lenny's reference to the Group Relations Conference. Some of you, of you I, I hope, have had that opportunity. I think it was more than just an interesting experience for a lot of the staff. I considered that the trans transition from the autocratic leadership that I referred to to something that was a little more consensual driven was only possible because of those conferences. Uh, they were in themselves uh, provocative. I, I used to think we didn't have cliques in that organization. What I wasn't acknowledging, however, is that there were those who went and those who didn't. And there was a certain degree of tension from one group to the other. However it was, it was, I think, a very important part of the transition process that I was at least involved with with many of you. I think it's quite remarkable. It's been 13 years, after all, since we had a sort of identity together. And here we are, all as if we were just yesterday. I think it's quite a dramatic statement of something. And there have been several comments so far about what that something might be, and I have a few more to add. I want to try to uh, identify a few of the elements that I thought, that I think, were part of the special spirit. They are, I'm sure, by no means exhaustive. They were the ones that came to mind first. And I think each of you may have your own variation that you'd like to add or modify or you can expand. Um, the first of these, I think, was the, the stimulating intellectual atmosphere. The people who were there repeatedly referred to how much they were learning. Now, in those days, there was not a lot of formal instruction. Uh, on the contrary, most of it was not only informal, but done at what seemed like a thousand and one conferences. Uh, but those were the, the context in which a great deal of learning took place. But there were two other parts of that. One is that everybody was both a student and a teacher. We don't literally talk to each other. It was not always a scientific or a theoretical matter that we talk to each other. Sometimes it was a matter of how we could manage to work together. Sometimes it was an effort to understand the provocations that the patients sometimes evoked in us. Sometimes it was a few fundamentals that we managed not to pick up in, I, I hope not grade school, but at least maybe college. But the point of it was that this was an atmosphere that, that was bubbling all the time. And that was, I think, a tremendous uh, a part of the experience. And uh, I came, uh, in this instruction, as a matter of fact, it's all me in more ways than one, but one I particularly know. Uh, when I came back in 1961, I had been, uh, I completed my residency at Boston. It took me about uh, eight years to do it. Two years in Austria, as I said. But uh, I've also uh, come with a, 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 head, a head of analysis. Uh, I was uh, coming back with the sense that Boston was the place where you thought went to if you really wanted to go on I, I didn't know about this place to speak after all. My old man ran it, what did he know? <laughs> well, I can Dr. Carl, did you? I should know a lot of it. When I got home, uh, brother, I got back here, and the first surprise was, was stated to me that I was going to go with supervision. Now, for me, in those days, still, supervision meant uh, a little like not being sent to the principal's office if he didn't do it quite right, and I didn't know if that was going to happen here. I had two marvelous supervisors, one was Phil Holson, and the other, Herb Schlesinger, very senior and very thoughtful person. What I learned is a very much better definition of supervision. It's a kind of joint learning experience in which you're both teaching and learning. And I, I took that as a epitome. I, I run in several times to, to, the, to the, the, the people who still think of supervision is a kind of put down, sort of teacher student relationship in which you better mind or do what you've been told. But, but that's not, that was not the case. 
There were a couple of learning experiences that I also remember. Uh, case conferences by Dr. Dr. Carl in the Catbird seat. Uh, quite often we'd be interrupted pretty much through about halfway through the first paragraph of the report that we had spent weeks, not weeks, but hours preparing for that. And it would be with demands of explaining what that word was. I said, you, why are you that one instead of this one? And he would not just make this comment in passing. This would be a mini lecture that went on for the rest, sometimes a couple for the rest of the hour. In any case, it was, it was pointed, it was direct, and invariably provocative. I thought of another uh, example of Dr. Carl's uh, uh, pointedness. He was being interviewed by a, a newspaper man who uh, looked around and saw all the people wandering around the country. He said, well, How many people work here? He said, About half. <laughs> I'm sure each of you has your own special story, Dr. Carl. You're an endless, endless generator. Well, I think, as I've already referred to, the conferences were, I think, a critical part of this learning experience. Because, again, it was, it, was, uh, it seemed to be organized in a hierarchy of honor. The senior analysts always sat here, and senior others sat over there. And so it went back rank by rank, department by department. And it was most residents were way back in the corner. But that was really more apparent than real. The reality was that we were all encouraged to be part of these conferences. Not simply as students, but also as commentators and people who were had something to uh, to have. Rose <coughs> Witherspoon had a comment today at one point. She said, I've been most impressed by the constant atmosphere which one's intellectual capacity is <coughs> in stress. Always I was pushed and pulled to think and to achieve my best and task at hand. I took this as a compliment. The second aspect, which is sort of akin to the first one, is the constant exposure to new information and new ideas. We had uh, uh, simply the Sloan professors who would come at intervals but they would be characters, some of you will remember, like Margaret Mead, very, uh, very helpful senior uh, analysts such as John Sullivan, and quite a number of people who came for sometimes uh, a day, sometimes uh, for a week, and occasionally for some longer period than that. But beyond what these people brought to us is what we were doing ourselves. Steve Applebaum wanted to explore these wild new therapies in California, the Schultz. I was green, Walter, a couple of three or four others that I've forgotten. I always thought, I, I had to come to King's face to approach with this. I said, look, Steve, if you could go out there and survive this experience, why well, I'm sure we could consider learning more about it here. He did, he came back and wrote, wrote a book called uh, Out in Inner, in Inner Space. I, I think it left a spark on him because he, he was uh, always very much aware of what new ideas he'd been exposed to and wanted us to be exposed to as well. But John Turner started exploring issues of, of uh, the, the uh, uh, retirement and in fact opened the unit which opened in, in the East Hospital in several uh, uh, later years. And Bob Conrad, who uh, gave us for all the emphasis on health and fitness. You know, we were, I guess, a pretty sedentary bunch never occurred to us in exercise that the psychiatrist needed to be used to it. That was, after all, another one of those California things. And we could very well stay exempt from that. But he, he introduced it not only as part of the patient program, but also as something for residents to get involved with and did. Elmer Green, as so many of you know, his pioneering work about feedback uh, and alternative therapies. Uh, the industrial mental health program initially started by Dr. Will, followed up by Dr. Levinson, Broker, Clemmy, Slaughter, and Conroy. Problems keep popping up. <coughs> the uh, beginnings of family therapy. The family therapy was a little akin to boom psychotherapy. It wasn't a dyadic relationship of analyst to patient or therapist to patient. It was a little suspicious. We don't know about this boom stuff. Well, family therapy was a kind of group stuff that carried with it some initial uh, hesitancy. 
But our men went out with Steve Jones for made such a remarkable contribution to this field that we really, in those days, were, were something of, of a beacon in that field. Uh, Len's already made reference to group psychotherapy. And so I've just added, groups were not eagerly accepted in an analytic environment. It was thought to be, uh, uh, again, a little too alien, not really personal or intimate enough. So it didn't have any real uh, power of treatment. The third aspect that I pointed out was, to, to that I thought about, was the options that, that all of us, many of us had. Not only we were hired for a particular job, but within a year, there might have been two or three other possibilities that some could have turned up. Not so much as promotion, as it were, uh, 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 auxiliary activities that you could expand what we were doing, might be shifted to another building or to another program. But what it did was to give people an opportunity to explore their own interests, to develop some special talents of theirs, and indeed become one of, uh, uh, another one of our teachers. The fourth one was the satisfaction from the work, work itself, especially with the patients, which involved intense engagement, uh, frustrations often, multiple challenges, and occasional successes. Fred uh, Chapman had an interesting comment to make about that. Quote, each time we helped patients pass through their demons and death, we all took a step forward. We recognized that pushing back in the arc of darkness for one was a victory for all. We sensed the dark parts of ourselves could be tamed a bit. It is a singular experience that we especially miss from community, family, really in which at our best, we draw uh, out the best of ourselves and benefit from that. Uh, a kind of informal healing, just as we try to provide for our patients. Well, Ben Bryant was just coming to me about it. Watching a group of professionals at work was like having a piece of art coming together. Working here has allowed me to become a part of this hard work and manage practice. Carly Krenitz, who I think may be here tonight, she had this comment to me. It's always felt like I'm going to spend the day with my friends. Last, not least, but in fact, probably to the first, except I want to make the climax, so I had to wait. <laughs> Our rewarding relationships. Many references to that already this evening, and I can only have to go out and echo them. It was this collegial equality that, that uh, as I've already said, didn't rest on the kind of authoritarian crisis, the authoritarian structure that is all to true in other places. And central to this rewarding relationships was the prevailing sentiment for one this year, feeling valued, mutually respected, and equal, mutual caring. John and Olive had a comment to make about it. He said, the most significant association I have to that here is kindness, evident in the help to provide to each other. Del Beauclair had this to say, everyone treats you with respect. People honored others and listened to their ideas and their suggestions. And Phyllis Bailey had this to say. I've always been allowed to feel a very much a part of this organization. And of the things that have always amazed me is the friendly carrying away that I've been treated by people with so much more stature and education than I have. I always felt valued and very much appreciated and a part of the team. I can tell you this attitude is not the norm and very hard to find. Throughout my own tenure as physician and president, I had very much the essential philosophy in my own head that there was an important isomorphic relationship that pervaded, pervaded that organization. How management dealt with staff was reflected in how staff and patients. And this was kind of a reciprocal relationship. What it meant was that, that we could assume that as we treated each other with respect and value, this is one of the qualities that would be transmitted into our other patients. And I think it was. I think it kind of put an enormous part of this 
successes we have in so many things. Again, to quote Fred Schreckman, relations with colleagues became the basis for healing relationships with patients. An example of this uh, biomorphism, how Carrie evokes Carrie, was provided by Ursula Zimmerman. She said, I was escorting a patient to an activity when suddenly the patient took off, running across the campus toward 6th Street, just back on the old East Campus. We were always fearful that suicidal patients would use that busy highway down 6th to carry out their plan. So I was running hard to catch up with the patient. And after a while, I started panting and breathing loudly. The patient heard me and stopped. Turned around to the back <coughs> to see if I was all right. She was. In short, and this is Sarah Beverly Parks comment, Medicare is a state of mind, heart, spirit, based on meaningful relationships. To summarize all of this, let me share with you a quote I'm sure you've heard me utter four times in the past that we carried out. But it still, for me, says as much about the organization as it does for the general philosophy of life itself. It's a quote of a rival Negro written in one of his books in 1915. Nothing that is worth doing can be achieved in our lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. Nothing which is true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. Therefore, we must be saved by faith. But nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished the world. Therefore, we must be saved. I love.